for the second talk of the morning. And I'm very pleased to have with me Nick Calvi, a colleague and a friend, honored to say this. Uh, professor, we asked him to deliver his CV and I'm struck by his modesty, I said that. That's what he delivered, which I will read for you. Nick Calvi is a sociologist of media and culture. He is professor of media communications and social theory at the London School of Economics and was, economics and was previously professor of media communications at Goldsmiths University of London. He is the author or editor of many books, 11 books, including Ethics of Media, Media Society World, and Why Voice Matters. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, for uh, being with us today and willing to share your ideas about uh, uh, what is being called in this business industry when you are talk big data. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hear your talk. I will move there, and when you finish, I can hear direct questions and answers. Well, um, thanks to Yanis for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here as part of this workshop, and I really wish I could be here all day, but as some of you may know, I'm actually organizing the conference, the other one that's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I am, for sure, double booked. But as we're here for today, hopefully we're up for the last series. And I would love to be here today. It's a terrific And in my talk, I want to, to consider what is at stake for critical social science in the rise of big data, what we call big data. Uh, I'm not a technical, I'm not a technical expert. So I'll take that mythical term as a given, because I want to be pretty. <laughs> And I come at this not as someone like many of you with major expertise, in particular methods of managing large data sets, but I come at it as a sociologist interested more broadly in all sorts of large-scale claims made about the social and our ways of knowing the social. Those claims are always closely intertwined with particular technologies for representing the social. Sometimes by media institutions, I've done a lot of work on that, but here by a much more heterogeneous group of institutions that make up the infrastructure of the online platforms and behind them the data industries that enable us to do so much of our social interaction today. And I see this particular encounter between sociology, or broadly critical social science, and the projects of big data as at root a moral and political encounter. Now, maybe it's a strange time for such an encounter. For many classic sociologists, the connections between sociology and moral or ethical concerns were completely obvious. So, for example, the late Robert Bella wrote in 1981 in an essay called The Ethical Aims of Social Inquiry, that to disjoin social inquiry from ethical concerns would impoverish it cognitively. Without a reference point in traditions of ethical reflection, the very categories of social thought, he argued, will be empty. And yet, by 2012, another leading sociologist, Axel Honecker, writes in his book, The I in We, that moral categories have all but disappeared from the theoretical vocabulary of sociology. Now maybe Honnett exaggerates the problem, but I think that the encounter with big data is a good forum for testing out those fears of a loss of a moral vocabulary in sociology. And I'll come back to that point at the end. Certainly, some of classic sociology's key tools seem wildly outdated for grasping the data-saturated social and political world that we now inhabit. Just to get a sense of that, let's go back for a moment to a classic from nearly half a century ago, Berger and Lukman's The Social Construction of Reality, one of the 1960s most influential sociological texts. Now, big data relates to knowledge, so one might assume that a sociology of knowledge would give us some tools for sociology's encounter with big data. And Berger and Lutman wrote a classic test in the sociology of knowledge. But here's how they write about that topic. 
They write that the sociology of knowledge must concern itself with everything that passes for knowledge in society. Well, that sounds fine. So we would assume that that would include claims about big data. But when Berger and Luckman give an account of what knowledge in the social sciences is, it's one that we really can hardly work with. Let me quote it. They talk about specific agglomerations of reality and knowledge that pertain to specific social contexts. So they mean, obviously, contexts of face-to-face -face interaction, but also an institution building. But it's particularly odd when they get on to how their account of how everyday knowledge is built up. And let me quote this more fully. It seems wildly out of date to us now. The reality of everyday life, they say, is organized around the here of my body and the now of my present. Typically, my interest in the far zones is less intense, certainly less urgent. I'm intensely interested in the cluster objects involved in my daily occupation. I may also be interested in what goes on at Cape Kennedy or in outer space. But this interest is a matter of private leisure time choice rather than an urgent matter of my everyday life. The leading account of sociology of knowledge in the 1960s. But as Dave Eggers' recent novel, perhaps it's better called a fable, The Circle, elegantly brings out, the claims being made to know my, our social, the social involved in our leisure time as much as our work time, now involve infrastructures that we cannot just ignore, let alone necessarily <coughs> trust. They involve claims to social knowledge which are being made and which involve tracking us during our everyday life and which are likely to be highly consequential for our ways of life. They're processes which certainly deserve, to quote Theodore Porter's famous account of quantification, they certainly deserve the name of the social technology. And this is happening primarily because of the drive to create new forms of economic value. We all know, of course, that the tracking of our activity on social media and other types of platforms is the basis of the value that, for example, Facebook sells to advertisers, and indirectly the value generated in the new data mining industry that has emerged to create further value out of that original data. As Joseph Thoreau explains in his book, The Daily You, Traditional media institutions now, if they are to survive, have to deal with this new industry, often offering their own data gathering capacities to tempt potential advertisers. But for this to happen, a lot of other work is in fact needed. Cultural work, if you like. An even bigger project is required, I would argue, of rebuilding the social so that it can be fully tracked and monetized. And the social at which data tracking processes are targeted has to be reconstructed all around us so that we really are present on the platform where value can be created. And this draws the leaders of this move directly into the work of social theory. In a video roadshow just before Facebook's flotation in 2012, Mark Zuckerberg himself claimed that Facebook is a fabric that can make any experience online social. Not exactly an abstract form of social theory, but one <coughs> closely tied to empirical research. Maybe we should think about Facebook as the largest piece of action research yet conducted. <laughs> In this talk, I will offer two ways of responding to this situation, to these puzzling, maybe disorienting dimensions of our encounter with a data-saturated world. The first is deconstruction, deconstructing what I call the myth of big data. And the second is an ethnographic approach to such a world, the approach I call social analytics. And I'll come back to questions of morality and justice at the end. So starting with deconstruction, this newly constructed social domain, its very possibility as a sign of major economic value, is really unimaginable without a myth without what I call the myth of big data. Now, of course, before you get angry with me, big data, the huge capacities of computer-based <coughs> analysis now increasingly influencing science, corporate and governmental agendas, is not itself mythical. Its practice clearly goes much wider than social media platforms as well. <coughs> Massive computing capacity really is vital 
to discovering complex patterns in huge data sets, for example, in the medical field. The servers that manage the flow of our everyday communications really do involve huge costs, on one estimate nearly $150 billion a year. And there really is a practical problem of interpreting all the important data now circulating. To give perhaps a, tr a trivial or a jokey example, a recent Japanese film launch generated 150,000 tweets per second. So if you took six to seven seconds to read, respond, send the response, not an unreasonably harsh uh, proposal, one million tweets would already be there, new ones, by the time you finished it. You would then have to return. But I'm interested really here in the claims now being made about what big data can achieve for understanding the social world. Those claims matter in part because big data capacity is increasingly integrated into advertising and marketing in the form of the means to track vast numbers of individuals. Data company Axiom claims now to track more than 700 million consumers globally at all times. So big data affects the wider field where market-based media can be funded, so it has all sorts of side consequences too. More broadly, big data advocates' claims about what counts now as social knowledge affect all of us that are interested in producing social knowledge, whether it's in the media, whether it's in academic disciplines that research the social, as Mike Savage and Roger Burroughs warned a few years back in an article called The Coming Crisis of Empirical Sociology. Big data's new politics of measurement, a term I borrowed from the anthropologist James Scott, I really are changing the terrain on which all large institutions, including governments, can now claim to tell us the way things are. Now, I'm not the first to talk about myth in relation to big data. There was a recent FT commentary along these lines by Tim Harford, which summarised various thoughts. Uh, and already last year, Tom Deutsch, a commentator on IBMDataMag.com, wrote of the vendor myths as he called it, about the qualities or problems with particular large data sets. More deeply, Kate Crawford at MIT Center for Civic Media, who with Dana Boyd has done a lot to draw academic attention to the issues around big data, spoke in May last year of the myths about the neutrality of big data sets, the quality of their data, and the, uh, our tendency to forget the skewing of those data sets, however vast the aggregation for the now possible. And as she put it in that, uh, when she was quoted in the New York Times, big data is something we create, but it's also something we imagined. And that's absolutely right. And I'm concerned here with an even more wide-ranging act of imagination that connects big data practices to our very possibilities for social knowledge. Let me take an example that I'll be deconstructing, which is Victor Meyer Schoenberger and Kenneth Kukier's book from last year, they may or may not be in the room. They are. They are, they are. Well, well, okay. <laughs> Maybe they, they could be listening. They got filmed. <laughs> they filmed, so I may get a hard time for this, but I'm going to deconstruct their book. Their book was called Big, Big Data, a revolution that will transform the way we live, work, and think. Okay, well, no. And they celebrate the fact that in response to the almost impossible challenge of making sense of the vast masses of data that we can now collect, Analysts are giving up on specific hypotheses and instead focusing on generating, through countless parallel calculations, generating a really good proxy for whatever is associated with a phenomenon, and then relying on that proxy as the predictor. Now, sometimes the proxy does make indirect interpretive sense as in the controversial case where uh, an American retailer, Target, started communicating online with a young woman on the basis that she was pregnant. Just because she started buying a basket of consumer products that their predictive model associated with women who would shortly start buying pregnancy products. Her father spotted the email, wasn't it, caused the sudden <laughs> when the baby arrived, he was happy, of course, but that's not really <laughs> Sometimes, however, the proxy makes no interpretive sense at all, and indeed, this is the author's point. 
this lack of sense, they say, doesn't matter because a really good proxy, once discovered, will help us see regularity across vast numbers of variables that would otherwise be invisible. And the result of this, then, they argue, is to undercut the rationale of not just qualitative methods of analysis, but I would argue also the hermeneutics that for decades has driven large-scale survey research, which is based on hypothesis testing. And note that if we reject the possibility of such a hermeneutics, we also disarm hermeneutic critique. So we're armor-plating the myth of big data against criticism. <coughs> Let's follow this troubling myth in a little bit more detail. In other work, I've argued that myth, following Maurice Bloch from the LSE and Roland Barthes, myth always works through ambiguity, sometimes claiming to offer us the truth, but at other times saying, no, no, we're not doing that. We're just being playful. Providing what in the George W. Bush era was called plausible deniability. But here at the level of claims about knowledge claims, it seems even fair. So Mayor Schoenberg and Kuki on the one hand say that big data bring an essential enrichment in human comprehension. And they go further, proposing a, a large project of datification that involves quantifying literally every aspect of everyday phenomena to enable big data analysts to find its hidden order. The result, they say, will be, quote, a great infrastructure project like Diderot's 18th century encyclopedia. This enormous treasure chest of datafied information, they say, once analyzed, will shed light on social dynamics at all levels, from individual to society at large. They also say the world will start to look different. We will no longer regard our world as a string of happenings that we can explain as a natural or social phenomenon, that is in their own terms, but we'll see them as a universe comprised essentially of information. On the other hand, when the moral consequences of acting on the basis of big data start to get a bit tricky, for example, we consider should we arrest people for offences that they're merely predicted to commit but haven't yet, to prevent the obvious utilitarian harm, well, they back off and they say, no, the big data only provide probabilities, not actualities, and they worry about the problem of fetishizing the output of our data analysis, exactly as they have in the rest of the <laughs> Mayer, Schoenberg, and Kukier is just one of many books and articles making similar mythical claims about big data. A trailblazing article, which I'm sure many of you know from 2007, by Wired magazine editor Chris Anderson called The End of Theory, announced that access to big data means out with every theory of human behavior from linguistics to sociology. Forget taxonomy, ontology, and psychology. I almost feel a song coming on. Well, why is this? He said, well, because the proxies that big data generate are good enough, or as Google's research director of Hui Quotes put it, you can succeed without, and they have succeeded. But success for who else? For what purpose? In the service of whose or what notion of knowledge? Google's clear. And that in many other data processing institutions, big and small. But the unintended side effects for the rest of us may, I want to suggest humbly, be less positive. Writing about how government's understanding of and decision making about its populations will increasingly rely on big data. And you may not know we're abolishing the survey in this country in the next cycle. The national census. Cleveland uh, Rupert suggests that we were all used to being governed not on the basis of our individual features but as what she calls data doubles that will supplant older notions of the general population. If you like, predictive strings that tell those who care what, say, a man in his 50s with a certain educational background will be doing on a grey Friday morning in April. <laughs> and we, of course, too, are involved in this myth's reproduction. We supply the information to government and countless other collectors, including social media platforms, about what we do as we do it, allowing that information to supplant other possible types of information about ourselves and how we might reflect on our lives. Algorithmic practices, in this very loose, broad sense, are now at the core, for example, of states' modes of managing border security, as Geographer Louise Amor writes, 
In development, then, I'm suggesting is a quite distinctive and new working model of what human beings are that validates new types of evidence and expertise and supplants other knowledges of our present and future. So to disenchant this bit, which is obviously what I would like to do, we need a new type of interpretation, or I'll call it a hermeneutic. Paradoxically, what we might call a hermeneutic of the anti-hermeneutic. Judith Butler provides a clue to this when in her book, Precarious Life, from 2004, she's discussing a media, how media of excessive spectacle, too much showing, actually narrows our grasp of the human and what we see in humans. She writes that this is less a dehumanizing discourse of work than a refusal of discourse. I'm interested in the refusal of discourse which involves equating our only forms of social knowledge with ungrounded probabilities, and then legitimizing a scale of knowledge production about the social on which <coughs> the, the self-reflexive individual seems now utterly irrelevant. We're not on the right scale. This raises, I think, fundamental questions about the individual <coughs> voice, something else I've written about, and the way voice is valued in societies. But this myth of big data is oriented to the social world very differently from other myths in the past about social knowledge and the rise of certain media or information technologies. It doesn't have its domain anymore exactly a national population or even particular collectivities that gather online. It builds its population data bit by data bit through a whole series of operations that bypass earlier notions of social interrelations. Let me just summarize these very schematically. Um, it splits up discourse populations, the groups that could once be talked about as populations for various purposes. It disaggregates. It fractures the space of discourse, depicting its data subjects in ways that don't connect anymore with the space of action and thought in which actual individuals think that they live. And it stretches the time of discourse aggregating action fragments from any moment in the stream of a person's recorded acts into patterns that may bear little relationship to how those persons themselves understand the sequence and meaning of their actions. Now, if you combine all that, maybe in themselves not necessarily objectionable for various purposes, but combine all that and mystify it through the myth of big data, and you risk, I think, replacing older ways of talking about the social world that still can be related to social actors, as we once knew them, with instead myriad data streams that lack any elements that connect with how individuals, with recognizable sets of aims and capabilities, continue to make sense of what they do. And so, since hermeneutics and the exchange of science is basically interpretation, is the basis of social life, we risk, I think, in installing the myth of big data into our working practices for generating social knowledge, we risk unraveling the social itself, or at least the languages of social description, on which not just sociology, but also justice and politics have relied. We risk building a social landscape peopled by what 19th century Russian novelist Nikolai Gogol called dead souls. Human entities, that have financial value, for sure. In his novel, if you remember, it was as mortgageable assets. Dead peasants, that the state didn't know were dead yet. He could still raise money on them. In our new world, it has unwitting data producers. But in both cases, it's entities that are not alive, not at least in the sense that we know human beings to be alive. And yet this transformation that I'm making sound paradoxical may not seem very odd to today's citizens, because we have become accustomed to giving accounts of ourselves in these data-saturated ways on social networking sites and elsewhere. And as such habits become established, we may lose our sense that our collective life could lie anywhere else than in such datafied forms. Indeed, this is exactly what we would expect if we remember, to quote Theodore Porter again, that the quantitative techniques used to investigate social and economic life work best if the world they aim to describe can be remade in their image. The norms of performativity and productivity encouraged around social media platforms 
can be understood as part of the remaking of the world that is required to install the myth of big data as a reality. We seem first to wake up to the implications of this, if we do, when it becomes clear, as it now has, that the state too aspires to know us through big data. As John Lanchester put it in a fine Guardian article last September, the surveillance capacities of the American and British states operate increasingly on the principle that, quote, all they need is everything. <laughs> it would be a mistake to see the problem, though, I stress this, as simply the big bad state. The world opened up by the Snowden revelations. That's actually precisely not the point, because the big myth of big data has already started rationalizing a state of affairs where a network of data gathering and data amalgamating institutions has or aspires to have everything. What Axiom calls big marketing data. As governments and corporations increasingly prioritize access to big data in their visions of how they will govern or profit or both, we're only a step away from the fact, and this is not a myth, the fact of continuous surveillance from all directions as the new basis of how societies in the world are ordered. A world in which, as Rebecca Solnit recently put it, the NSA is not the enemy of Facebook and Google so much as their rival. <laughs> so much for deconstructing the myth of big data. Clearly, that's not enough. In response, we have to work on reconstruction too. It's not enough to simply reject the myth of big data. Jared Lanier, the inventor of virtual reality in the 1990s, insists in one of his recent books that people not algorithms are the only sources and destinations of information. Stirring crime. Who would disagree? I certainly would. But when a vast attempt is underway to build a different account of how and why people matter, it's not enough just to say that people matter. We need an alternative account of why knowledge about people matters for understanding the social, and indeed why the social matters if understood as more than just a probability set for predicting repeat actions. Now we shouldn't assume here that academic critique is always our friend. There is no room, for example, for hermeneutics in some social analysis that's recently come out around affect. I'm referring here, maybe unfair to pick a work out particularly, Patricia Clough's work, which claims, for example, critically in a sense that uh, capitalism and database securitization have produced a world where, quotes, pre-conscious, pre-individual affect modulation is all there is. Now that analysis is by no means the only example, because it abandons, maybe for critical reasons, it abandons any language for interpreting what human subjects mean by their action. It actually condemns us like sleepwalkers, to submit to precisely those changes it claims to predict. Indeed, as a sociologist, I'm quite troubled by the misalignment of social imaginaries, in Charles Taylor's term, that is implied by today's competing accounts of how we get to know our shared world. Some critical theory, apparently critical theory, operates with a social imaginary that fits perfectly well with the imaginings of big data discourse by renouncing any claim to interpret social meaning. But in the process, I think it loses touch with the imaginary that was for so long social science's starting point. And I mean, Weber's account of sociology is the science which attempts the interpretive understanding of social action. Sorry to bring up this old class. It has to be done. As my colleague Robin Mansell in the Department of Media and Communications here argues in her book Imagining the Internet, we can't move it beyond these sorts of <coughs> misalignment unless we build new imaginaries or at least renew our hold on old ones. And that involves, to some degree, I would suggest, a project of recovering those earlier starting points, maybe reaffirming in some version, I stress in some version, the hermeneutic principles of the Weberian model of social science. Otherwise, social science risks being washed away with the end of theory. But also it means reconnecting this hermeneutic principle with today's genuine and uh, valid excitement 
about what access to very large data sets might mean for the future of social science and for citizens. It means addressing what Emily Muprichard in a blog last year for social knowledge wrote uh, what's the, called the challenge of too much data, but doing so from the perspective of hermeneutic social science. Not abandoning our tools. Now we obviously need to be very careful how we formulate this move. So we have to avoid a methodological trap that's endemic to the digital world, where action appears to be reduced to or even replaced by its traces in text. I would call this the inscription fallacy. Pierre Bourdieu, way before anyone imagined social media networks, was the first to spot this in his reflections on anthropological fieldwork. That is the risk he spotted that as academics disposed to interpret the world through reading texts, we tend to treat the world that's presented us in any situation as if it were a text, ready and appropriate for us to read. So failing to reflect on the social conditions that produced this very possibility of interpretation by us. If Borgia's argument was designed to insist on the importance of the materiality of practice that obviously underlies the appearances through which the world always presents itself to the interpreter. The problem for interpreting an online world is in a way much broader. It's the risk of treating the textual traces of online processes as themselves what there is, all there is to be interpreted. And I find traces of this inscription fallacy in much writing about social networks, even in some of the work on the information politics that I really admire, such as Richard Rogers' work from Amsterdam. Rogers' work, which at least in some of its more programmatic forms, I'm thinking particularly of his article, The End of the Virtue of Digital Methods, tends to treat the work of what he calls natively digital methods, which he wants to support, as grounding new claims about cultural and societal change simply by following the media, the web media, and following how objects and actors operate and function within it, without going on to talk much more about the possibility that there might be some tension between the representations of the social enacted online and other representations of the social, which are not enacted. Rogers offers some great tools, find summons to study how the world appears to us digitally, why it appears to us that way, not another way, how we need to think about those differences. I fully support what he does. But I question whether the, his resulting web epistemology, what does it amount to? Is an epistemology of the web the same as an epistemology of the social or the cultural? And if not, how are we to think about that difference? and its consequences for us in social and cultural actors. He doesn't tell us. This leads me to the second sociological response to the challenge of big data, which I want to discuss, the final thing I'll discuss. And that is thinking quite differently about agency in a world characterized by the myth and the actuality of big data and big data gap. By agency, I mean here not just any brute act, clicking on this button, pressing like to this or that thing going on. But I mean following Weber, the longer processes of action based partly on reflection, giving an account of what one has done, even more basically making sense of the world, so as to act within it. And yet another danger for critical social science is to give up on agency in a world where so many of our acts are liable to be fed into predictive models that have no interest in that sort of meaning. And one response to the rise of big data in sociology has been to argue that, regrettably, all agency has now been subsumed by what Scott Lash calls algorithmic power. But this confuses big data's discourse, its mythical vision of a ready-to-be-datified universe for the much messier world we live in. New forms of agency are emerging that do not ignore the seeming inevitability today of being watched and counted, but they try and address them, they try and deal with this real world possibility. Pursuing that doesn't mean denying, on the contrary, doesn't mean denying that the starting points for a hermeneutics of the social world are in key ways being transformed by big data. 
uh, by the embedding of algorithmic calculation and its results into the everyday. And we need, I suggest, a new type of social research that actually addresses this possibility. And I call this research possible this direction social analytics. That is the study of how social actors are themselves using analytics data measures of all kinds, including those they <coughs> themselves have developed or customized, to meet their own ends. For example, by interpreting the world in new ways. In a world that is starting to be shaped by the myth of big data, social analytics tracks, for example, alternative projects of self-knowledge, group knowledge, institutional knowledge, projects whose ends are not the tracking of data for its own sake, or for the profit that can be made directly from the data itself, but rather whose ends are social, civic, cultural, or political goals. This social analytic approach also tracks people's practices of resisting the introduction of analytics-based tools as default forms of management, of evaluation. And Susan Scott here at LSE has been doing fascinating work in the tourism industry about the impacts of TripAdvisor's data model if you happen to work in the tourism industry, which is quite profound. A social Analytics approach conversely tracks those people using analytics, even big data, to build new forms of civic and social action, for example, to govern cities. Just to explain, this idea of social analytics, which of course I borrow illegitimately from Adobe, but I don't, cannot make sense of a world in which someone can claim to own such a phrase, social analytics. Um, this idea of social analytics emerged from the Story Circle project that I led until last summer at Goldsmiths. It was particularly a project that we did with a community reporter organization in the north of England that led to the idea. It struck us that in the digital world, where to be is already to be measured, being an organization with social ends is, is quite challenging. It raises a challenge of real sociological interest at least to those of us still concerned with meaningfully oriented behavior. For there, in how organizations gather data about their website's workers, how they think about metadata and its uses, how they reflect on how as organizations they might change in response to such information, <coughs> such redesign of their websites and so on. There in raw form are everyday battles to make sense of a data-saturated world in terms of social actors' own goals, not just data production alone. Another parallel, hopefully forgive me for making this, I haven't done whether with he will agree or not, but another parallel that I see to social actors lies with the work that Yanis Kalinikos and Nicolo Tempini will be discussing this afternoon. Their project on the socially complex processes of generating and interpreting health data around a health-focused social media site in the US. Still other possibilities of social analytics emerging around the world of urban activists to use large data sets to empower citizens to take part in the governance of their living spaces in new ways, which my colleague Alison Powell in the media department is working on. Conceived in this way, a hermeneutically based social science really can connect with important issues of justice and information politics that would otherwise be completely missed. And here to end, I want to make a point about justice. So any form of social concentration of social knowledge raises questions about justice. The justice of who owns that knowledge and so on, who has access to it. But it becomes very difficult to hear those questions when the infrastructure of knowledge production works as deep within the background of our daily lives as does the collection of big data. So I think we should be very grateful, for example, to American scholar Julie Cohen, legal scholar, for beginning to raise justice issues emerging from our reliance on the digital infrastructure that underlies our lives today, basically. As she notes, we all increasingly operate in our daily lives in network space, but the configuration of network space is increasingly opaque to its users. It's all the users. Indeed, she argues today's web of protocols and passwords, data requirements, data monitoring, and so on, has created, in a very striking phrase, a system of governance that is authoritarian. And in the sense that there seems little alternative but to comply with. And here, at the intersection between the desire to do just what we ordinarily do, 
And the new information sectors need to track us across this datafied space of appearances. Here, a vast power asymmetry is emerging that I suspect would not be tolerated if it were exclusively state power that was benefiting. But as I noted earlier, we cannot easily prevent the state seeking to benefit from the big data-generated infrastructure. And that's precisely what it is trying to do. So essential to raising questions of justice here is, first of all, to validate our acts of struggling with that infrastructure, or working critically with it. And that's the project of social analytics that I've just outlined. And secondly, it's essential by doing so to recover our connection with an easily forgotten point about how our ability to make justice claims is always based in our ways of communicating about the social world. The myth of big data seeks to install a version of social knowledge that lacks any interpretative terms from which comparisons of how things stand for different individuals, the basis of justice claims, might be built. But if we accept that, we forget a key point of which Amartya Sen reminds us in his recent reworking of the theory of justice, that communication is the site where life well comparisons that ground claims for injustice get made. As he puts it at the end of his book, The Idea of Justice, it's bad enough that the world in which we live is so much deprivation of one kind or another. It would be even more terrible if we were not able to communicate, respond, and altercate about those injustices. And yet, I'm sorry for this warning, but that through the myth of big data, we are starting to give credence to a working model of social knowledge that operates as if the explanation of human action and the processes of meaning making on which explanation has always relied don't matter anymore. As Chris Anderson put it at the end of that article, the end of theory, who knows why people do what they do? The point is they do it. To turn our back on hermeneutics in this way, entertaining maybe at first, is merely the latest example of what philosopher <coughs> Hans Georg Gadamer once called the alienation of the interpreter from the interpreted. I simply don't believe that Chris Anderson doesn't care why he does what he does. And here in our astonishment at this form of bad faith, we may have the beginnings of an answer to sociology's apparent moral deficit with which I start. Either we accept the territory that Anderson maps out, the myth of big data, and the new drastically reconfigured and shrunken version of the social science terrain that it offers, and if so, the very basis of sociology's moral dimension is abandoned. Or we can reject that direction. And by rejecting it, we are involved in the struggle for a critical stance on what Yanis Kalinikos and Niccolo Tempini call computed sociality. I like the passive voice term. I like computed sociology. This, in effect, is a moral struggle, a struggle against a powerful and well-resourced, and I'm facing a very positive example of something much more general and not always so positive, which is what Pierre Bourdieu once called the universalization of the means of access to the universe. So in closing, let me recall one largely forgotten precedent for this contemporary struggle that dates from a much earlier stage in the history of modern societies, modern states, and their strategies for knowing the world. Friedrich Schiller's reflections in the 1790s on much earlier languages of state building. I found it by chance while preparing this talk, but it seemed to resonate. He wrote, in 1795, the state remains forever a stranger to its citizens since at no point does it ever make contact with their feeling. Forced to resort to classification in order to cope with a variety of its citizens, never to get an impression of humanity except through representation at second hand, the governing sector ends up by losing sight of them altogether, confusing their concrete reality with a mere construct of the internet. While the government cannot but receive with indifference laws which are scarcely, if at all, directed to them as persons. As Schiller saw, a polity based on an impoverished model of the human subject cannot expect much loyalty from or legitimacy with those it governs. The warning holds whether it's governments that are promoting the construct of the intellect in question, or as now very often dense networks of corporations 
that are not yet responsive to concerns about the general interest in the same way, perhaps, as the data-gathering state of the 19th century sometimes was. Now, the right response to these new strategies, this new situation, is not, of course, to walk away from the challenges and opportunities to which, as forms of social interconnection, information, social production, they give rise. That would be negative, head in the sand. The right response instead is to make sure that in facing those challenges and thinking creatively about these opportunities, we take care to hold on to our richer accounts of human agency and knowledge and to the sense of possible democratic agency and possible justice whose basic proponents they supply. And I believe that a critical, hermeneutically grounded social science can play a crucial part in that process. So, thanks. For That's a wonderful talk. Uh, questions, guys, issues, objections, everything is allowed. Uh, Mike Cushman. Nick, thanks for that. Just one question, really. Is, is this big data so, as theory free as you're alleging, or is it encoding? a whole theory of social action around economic efficiency and a neoliberal project to privilege a certain way of behaving. So drawing from my own example of looking at the management of the voluntary sector to moving the management of the sector through outputs, which is not theory free, it's very heavily driven by a very strong theory. That's a great question, I'm glad you asked it. I, I decided to put the argument in the way I did without mentioning that vital point, because then at least, even those who don't agree with me on the sort of point you just made, would listen to where I see the dangers, which I think are common dangers. They affect all of us. They, they really are serious dangers for all of us, whatever our political beliefs are starting from. However, I do agree with you that one uh, uh, fertile uh, ground for this myth is that chain view of human subjectivity that came out of neoliberal projects, which I've written my previous book called Why Voice Matters was on that. And that's why I just mentioned obliquely halfway through voice, but I didn't want to labour it because I don't anticipate that people necessarily agree with that view of the past 20, 30 years of political history. They might be entitled absolutely to disagree. But here we now have a hardened through to the simplified, stripped down uh, machine for implementing something like that. Um, it doesn't have to rely on arguments of that sort. It's relying on much more powerful arguments, which are the sorts of arguments that relate to social technologies and measurement and quantification and so on. Ted Porter's writing on his book, but applied on a very large scale and installed into everyday mechanisms of account in which we ourselves are involved in. So that's a massive extension. So you're absolutely right that I left it to one side quite deliberately. But we need to then link it back to that, to for those of us who agree with the position we just uttered, to be even more concerned. Yeah. Are there questions? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, a really amazing talk. I was wondering, though, uh, observing social media and what is happening on social media. Um, I am under the impression that not only they produce a new knowledge of the social, so uh, the big data, uh, social fact, but also they give indication on how to interpret this knowledge. Uh, this, the knowledge that they produce as social fact on social media um, are also, uh, is also lived out uh, as indication of interpretation by recommendation or uh, relevancy. So there is also this problem, the fact that uh, probably not only a new knowledge is produced out, but also a new indication of how to interpret this knowledge. Did this create some, some problem? And yeah. I wonder what well, do you think about it. I absolutely agree. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll read me as myth obsessed, which uh, <laughs> I have spent a lot of time thinking about myth as a way of deconstructing very complex configurations where where ideology doesn't even get near to the complexity of what's going on. Um, in another speech, I linked this myth of big data to a prior myth that's going on, built kind of most slightly earlier, but it's, it's also working alongside, which is what I call the myth of us, 
Um, I won't go into that in great detail, but it's basically questioning the idea uh, of the value we put into the apparent access to real sociality that we get when we observe people acting on whatever online platforms they happen to act on. Because we invest so much in that act of interpretation and forget uh, one basic thing, that it's precisely the believing in those spaces, the spaces for the social, that is the core of the economic value that has been generated through those platforms. It is the basis of their economic model. If we stop believing, we'll still do things, but we won't be, believe we won't be reading into them anything larger. But this is the issue around all claims to social knowledge. The social, in one sense, remains almost impossibly intangible and distant from any claims. It's too vast. So it's a perfect breeding ground for all sorts of myths. And the, the myths take a contingent form, which is constantly there. And this, that's another aspect to this, that uh, the over-interpretation of what goes on in social media practice, which is not to say that important things aren't happening, but they're particular things that need to be interpreted as particular things, which is not the same as the social being transformed in this sort of place or the, the nature of the political changes. So thanks for raising that. There's another part of the other. I think we will look first, just for Yeah, I'd be the first one to talk to you, thank you very much. Um, one, uh, only one point, uh, I think you assume that the data collection will always increase and will be more and more uh, data available for people over time. And I'm not sure that's necessarily true. I think if you look at something like Twitter, due to the fact it's public, the quantity of tweets will always go up because people use it more and more. But things like Facebook, they're, they're kind of public by accident. The data you put on there, you intend to only be, if you like a photograph, you only tell your friends to see that. It's just about the data is owned by Facebook or whatever, and therefore analytics can be done on it. If, but I think it, the fact is the tools are going faster than people's ability to manage the data or understand what gets done to their data. And I think as you look, look, look forward into maybe five years' time, people realize, well, I don't want all my private information being in such more substantially a public fashion or you know, public analyze also. I think you'll see a shift towards services which are intended to be public, like Twitter and future comments, where we will grow in terms of data collection. But people's private data might actually shrink dramatically. The tool will come around to manage it, or new tools will come around that are privacy-based and not essentially us yeah, that's a very good point. And obviously, I'm, I'm talking in very broad terms just to give a sense of the potential direction of how we might think about where that could lead us. But as you say, there always has to be a possibility of resistance. That's why, if I was just talking about the myth, that really wouldn't be adequate. One has to look at what I call social analytics. But it's broadly the whole field of social action where people are not taking for granted this shift. Well, they're thinking critically about it, as you say, as we know, there are tools to design to stop you generating yeah. data. They've already started to be marketed. They may become popular. There may be more explicit forms of political resistance. We don't know. Um, I think that uh, the thing we have to, one, one should note those and study them carefully. I think the thing we have to note is that, that's why, again, I use the word myth and not ideology. This type of... Um, uh, configuration of things based around this range of data collection and the automatic use of it as the only basis of keeping certain platforms profitable and then we need the platform so we sort of say okay anything just do it um, creates a situation where it is very hard a to articulate the issue sometimes as a specific issue and then very hard to know what to do about it Yes, the idea, I'll use that special clever thing to stop me generating too much data. But the idea of pulling out altogether for these platforms is very difficult. And that's why I think Julie, Co I was very struck to read you know, a sober legal theorist like Julie Cohen um, writing about this as a, a legal issue that actually doesn't have it, uh, an implication or link to it around the, what she calls this authoritarian system. Authoritarian is a very subtle form of power doesn't necessarily work to enforce you. It certainly doesn't work to enforce you. It works by changing the terrain on which you have little choice but to walk and, and orientate yourself within. And that, since none of us have the capacity individually to change to build the terrain, that is a social challenge to build terrain, it isn't easy to know how those things will grow. We have to observe it, but I think that's why I stress it, because I think the myth will grow and reinforce 
I don't normally quote Slavoj Žižek, the Lacanian theorist. In fact, I, it's really not my thing at all. But there's one sentence he used that I thought was spot on, so I always use it. He said in his deconstruction of Marx's notion of ideology, which he thought was hopelessly out of date, he said, it doesn't matter what we're saying, we're doing the things. We're doing it. And I think that, that type of myth, but not ideology, equals that, um, that we, we're looking at. And it's what we're doing anyway that is the level which we need to think about. Uh, the key driver. Another three, yes, and another three people lift up the hand. Shall I take them all together to uh, maybe you to speed, we need to speed up a bit? Yes, we don't have to go to land. I'll, so I'll, I'll take them all away. So Federico, Karsten, and Marie. Yeah, I'm going to be very brief. I really enjoyed your presentation. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I wonder what's at stake here. Are we witnessing the emergence of a new form of sociality where, for instance, the right to be forgotten is lost? Uh, data ownership is changing, evolving. Um, because they don't have open access or whatever to happen in the future. So are we witnessing new emergence of new rights while losing you know, other rights in the future? Well, yes, so uh, my comment was, what question was, uh, was around this notion of I, which I, I, I really like, the idea of trying to sort of reformulate criticality and and my worry that, that uh, you know, it's like Giddens' old example of <coughs> anti-globalization movement uh, being organized on the World Wide Web. So, so the point of whether, whether the, the logic of big data by looking at criticality within it becomes beyond a reproachment, that, that it is a matter of fact, and in that sense you're trying to, to map out a path between skill and charybdis that is very difficult, that you either you know, you get absorbed by it or you're a, a, a bystander, and I think that, that could be a bit of a challenge in your project. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask whether this critique, your critique, could be applied as a means of, sort of extending existing work on um, critiquing use of information systems, performance management systems in yes. institutions. Yeah. Um, you talked about people giving up on agency when their data is fed into a model, and we see this in public services with health services and patients feeling disenfranchised, feeling overlooked um, because it's meaningless that bean counting going on has nothing to do with their experience of care. Yeah. Well, let me start with that last one. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I only mentioned it briefly because it's their work, not mine, but I think um, Susan Scott and Wanda Olikowski's work on uh, the tourism industry and TripAdvisor, I'm not sure if it's out yet, I've heard them present it, is getting to that sort of point, with, which is basically not through any conspiracy, not through any malevolence, no one, but just by businesses trying to do rationally better what they should be doing, which is to use resources efficiently, uh, monitor their staff in a way the neighbors need to perform well, and so on and so forth. They use tools which, as it were, silently, except TripAdvisor isn't exactly silent, um, it's deeper mechanisms of silent, and the weight that's given to it isn't always fully articulated, it's just practical. So that more subtle sense of silent, um, a deeply disabling, um, you know, you, you've just uh, served a Someone to happen not look to like the way you serve the meal, the way you went up, it's a valid opinion, you would debate, discuss it, but it comes out as a, a measurement, uh, maybe a harsh one, and your manager sees it the next morning in your calling and so on. Now, the question, this then links to <coughs> Carson's question about how one thinks about resistance here, um, because clearly if we're looking at a massive reconfiguration of the spaces of action and thought and reflection, which is what I think we are, that's in one sense why it's so profoundly exciting as well. Um, there is this massive problem, the, the erosion relation to globalization is arising in relation to the auto-globalization movement, uh, Occupy, whatever, they're using the same platform to speak back to power. And clearly there's a tactical possibility there, but the question is, is there any strategic possibility? And I'm talking about strategic change. I think uh, clearly that is the challenge. Um, there's one, one I will mention a youth is Mechias has written a very interesting and thoughtful book in this book called Off the Network, which is arguing for a rethinking of our assumed relations to these networks. Not saying we pull out, it's absurd, but saying we should at least take it allow ourselves to rethink this relationship and see what the consequences of that rethinking 
would be. It might be certain justice claims, which at the moment we don't have a full normative language for, let alone a mechanism, a resolution mechanism for, but we may gradually feel it's important to raise them. We can't not raise them. And that, of course, could be the beginnings of change. So I think we have to look at uh, possibly profound forms of institutional change, as institutions increasingly wire these sorts of surveillance mechanisms into play. But this will take time, and of course I don't have a map for that, but that will be um, that will be the way of looking at it. We have to accept the problem as immediately paradoxical unless we're prepared to take on a bigger project of institutional transformation. Um, which relates to Federico's very interesting question. I mean, some people do say the new form of sociality is emerging. That theme's been around for five or ten years. Some people talk about the post-social relations, Karen Noor, Satina. Um, and it's possible certain major changes are going on. And None of us, certainly not me, are able to, to spot a paradigm shift at the moment it's happening. I mean, that's clearly beyond any individual interpreter's capacity. But uh, I think we have to be quite careful about saying that's going on and then working on that assumption. Because we need to spend more time unpacking what has always been at stake in the models of sociality we've been working with. And that's why I wrote a book about voice, because I don't think it's a trivial thing say that human beings carry an account of themselves. And if they have no chance whatsoever in their life to give that account to anyone, they die in some sense disabled. They've lost, they've lacked something absolutely important. And so I don't think it's trivial easily to say that employees in a workplace need at some point the chance to give an account of their life from their perspective in that workplace. So I think any larger scale model that for good or bad reasons installs a value system and a measurement system based on that value system that doesn't give any space time, doesn't give any value to that, it is deeply problematic and I think the problems will gradually emerge. And that's not because it's anyone's fault, it's because we are in the middle of a very complex transformation. That we have to all think about very, very seriously about this implication. And to do that, I'm, I'm not, I think, conservative by temperament, but I simply don't know where to look except back to resources which have helped us in the past interpret this to grapple with the challenges of the future, which were absolutely unanticipated when Schiller was writing. So that's why I go back not to say we can recover something, whatever it was, mythically in the past, on the contrary, but we need tools of some sort. And for me, those sorts of tools, which let's call them humanistic, uh, I don't have any track with post-humanism. Uh, humanistic term, based around the, the, the unarguable conditions of human life, uh, are our only tool. We have to start using it in more imaginative ways than we have in the past. I can uh, bring forth that by a quote from this area, and, to, and time, part, and time, future, is retained in time past. Thank you very much.